Just as important as understanding the different types of lenders, is understanding the underwriting process overall. The underwriting process is fairly similar regardless of the type of lender used in large part because underwriters must follow an objective set of guidelines in assessing a mortgage application. Deviation from these guidelines could raise flags of discrimination or bias. The time frame for underwriting can vary greatly, from a few days to a few weeks. Each case is different, depending on the borrower's finances, the underwriter, the type of home being purchased, among many other variables. Step 1. Getting pre-approval. The very first step a home buyer should take is to get pre-approved for a loan. It's important to note that pre-approval is not the same as pre-qualification, though the two are often used interchangeably. Pre-qualification is a far less rigorous process than pre-approval, and so when a buyer is ready to put an offer in a home, it's pre-approval that they want. Unlike pre-qualification, pre-approval signals to sellers that the buyer is serious and ultimately speeds up the process overall because some initial hurdles for financing have already been cleared. A home buyer lacking pre-approval in a hot market is likely to lose out on a lot of potential homes. To get pre-approved, the client must fill out the mortgage application, and the lender will verify the borrower's income, debt, credit rating, and assets. This process takes a bit longer than getting pre-qualified, so it's important your client knows the difference. Getting pre-approved can take as long as one to two weeks, so it's important the client does this before they're ready to put a bid on a home. Pre-approval from a lender generally means that the lender has agreed to offer the borrower a pre-approved amount, and that offer is typically good for 60 days, which is how long the credit report is good for. It's important to note, too, that this is not a commitment on the part of the lender. It's not a guarantee that the lender will give the borrower a loan, rather, it's a good faith offer based on the initial financial information provided by the borrower. Similarly, your client should know that getting pre-approved from a lender is not a commitment on the part of the borrower to accept a loan from that lender. This simply establishes the borrower's viability to actually be able to purchase a home they bid on. There are three key criteria examined for pre-approval. 1. Debt to Income, DTI, Ratio. DTI is gross monthly payments, debt, divided by gross monthly income. Ratios vary depending on the type of loan and amount requested but lenders typically look for a DTI of approximately 36% or lower. Borrowers may have a DTI as high as 43% and still be approved. The lower the DTI, the more an applicant can borrow, and in an escalating market, this can mean the difference between getting a home or losing one because the buyer will have more flexibility in their ability to increase their offers in a bidding war. 2. Assets a borrower's assets help lenders determine where the down payment will come from and how much cushion a borrower has should they experience financial hardship during the process of the mortgage loan. Money in savings and checking accounts, retirement funds, trust and gift funds, as well as cash on hand, are examples of a borrower's assets. Typically lenders look for three to six months of reserves in addition to the down payment. 3. Credit. Once the loan application is complete, it's submitted into AU, Automated Underwriting or DU, desktop underwriting, that delivers a preliminary evaluation. A conditional loan approval, CLA, is issued along with the borrower's tri-merge credit report. A tri-merge report is unique to the mortgage industry. There are three primary credit reporting agencies, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. For smaller loans, like a car or student loan, typically a credit report from one agency is enough. But because of the size of most mortgage loans, all three agencies' reports are pulled into one tri-merge report. The middle FICO score is typically used for a single borrower, and the lower of the two scores is used for two applicants. Ultimately, the CLA, eligible or not eligible, will have conditions that will need to be met before the issuance of a commitment to lend. Finally, it's important for realtors to ensure that lenders are actually fully and correctly performing the pre-approval process before issuing pre-approval to clients. Step 2. Search for home and sign a purchase agreement. Once your client has an offer on a home accepted, they will sign the purchase agreement, which then kicks the next phase of underwriting into gear. The purchase agreement, also called the purchase and sale agreement, is a binding legal contract between the seller and the buyer. The buyer also puts down an earnest money deposit, which is typically at a minimum 1-3% to of the sale price. Knowing a client's debt to income ratio is also very important during this search phase. Sometimes borrowers get pre-approved for what they would like to spend on a house rather than the full amount that their credit and DTI will allow. 
In a buyer's market, this might not have much significance, but in a seller's market that's prompting bidding wars and driving prices above asking, your client will likely lose out on any chance to purchase a home because they won't have the capacity, based on their pre-approval, to escalate offers and compete with home buyers who are pre-approved for more. Having a firm grasp of DTI and being pre-approved to the fullest extent of their credit qualification allows your client to target their desired price range, but also have the flexibility to compete in an escalating market. Step 3. Additional Examination of Finances The pre-approval is a critical first step in securing both a home and a mortgage, but the underwriting process doesn't begin and end there. Once a client has signed a purchase agreement, the underwriter will examine all of the borrower's financial information again. In looking for what's generally referred to as the three C's credit, capacity, and collateral, the borrower will often be required to respond to additional queries about their finances and also supply additional documentation. It's important at this stage that, 1, the borrower know this is a normal part of the process, and, 2, be both patient and responsive to these queries. Complaining or delaying will not get your client any closer to securing a mortgage, in fact, it will ultimately diminish their chances. You can help your client by providing an advanced list of documents that lenders in your area typically request so they can begin compiling the information. Lender requirements differ, but most require Social security numbers and birth dates Photo identification Paycheck stubs showing year-to-date earnings W-2 or 1099 tax forms for the past two years Employer's name, address, and telephone number, current and for the last two years account statements for checking, savings and other accounts Statement of current assets, IRA accounts, investment accounts, employee retirement accounts, brokerage accounts outstanding loan balances and monthly payments along with lender information, such as auto loans, student loans, and credit cards. Current and previous addresses over the last two years. Current mortgage balance and payments or the name and address of the landlord and monthly rent payment. Copy of the purchase contract. Note that race, gender, ethnicity, and other demographic information were expanded on the ULA in 2021 to ward off discrimination and bias. Additional documentation for some situations. Military and Veterans. Veterans Affairs, VA, Loan. Applications require a copy of the bar or DD-214 form, discharge papers, or a certificate of eligibility, CE, active duty military may also need a power of attorney and an alive and well statement. Self-employed. Borrowers who are self-employed or compensated by commission should provide federal tax forms for the last two years along with the current year-to-date profit and loss statement. Employment and business locations of self-employed borrowers must be independently verifiable. Dip income must also be verified. Divorcees. Borrowers who are separated or divorced must provide a copy of the divorce decree or separation agreement, court dated and filed. Alimony and child support payments may count as income or debt, provide proof of payment for the past year. Financial subsidies and gifts. Social security, pension, disability or any form of public assistance benefits qualify as income. The borrower must provide a copy of an award certificate or a copy of a check from the issuing agency. If the source of the down payment is a gift or money borrowed from relatives, the lender may request documentation. Past financial distress. If the borrower has experienced a bankruptcy or foreclosure judgment within the past seven years, information about the proceedings must be provided. For bankruptcies, documentation should include a copy of the bankruptcy discharge, a schedule of both debts and assets, and an attorney's letter explaining the outcome of the proceedings. In some instances, a borrower might be able to secure a mortgage loan after 24 months from discharge. Step 4. Lender Appraisal as this additional examination of finances is being conducted, the lender will hire an independent appraiser to determine the value of the home to ensure that the property is indeed worth the amount of the loan they're issuing. If the value is not at or above the price the buyer and seller agree to, then the buyer should discuss options with their agent. This is not uncommon in an escalating market. If the lender appraises the value of the home to be at or more than the loan itself, the process moves on to the next step. There's often a misconception among appraisers and real estate agents that they cannot or should not speak to each other during the appraisal process, but this is a myth, and an unproductive one at that. In fact, real estate agents and appraisers should be communicating with each other during the process. The real estate agent represents the best interests of their client, while the appraiser is not to serve any party's interests and should be a neutral independent party, trying to determine the most appropriate appraisal price. To this end, 
Appropriate communication can help facilitate this process and help the appraiser arrive at the most accurate, fair price. So what determines appropriate versus inappropriate communication? Appropriate communication. Real estate agents can provide appraisers with the following information that will be both relevant and helpful for the appraiser to consider. After all, good appraisals rely on good information. Agents should provide the following. Copy of the sales contract. Applicable comparable sales in the area. Evidence of notable renovations. House maintenance records. Inappropriate communication. There is of course a line that agents need to be mindful of. Agents shouldn't tell appraisers how to use information, or how to do their appraisal. Agents shouldn't state the desired value for the property or the amount of the loan. Agents shouldn't try to intimidate or bribe an appraiser in any way, for example. Promising future work. Threatening to withhold future work. Step 5. Title search and insurance. The lender will also do a title search, by hiring a title company, to ensure the property doesn't have any outstanding legal claims or liens on it, and the lender checks to ensure that the property is legally transferable to the borrower. Lenders require that the property's title be insurable. If everything checks out, title insurance is issued that guarantees the accuracy of the findings. Step 6. Closing. Assuming your client clears all the underwriting hurdles and is approved for a mortgage, the final step is sealing the deal at closing. At least three days prior to the day set for closing, the borrower should receive a closing disclosure CD, from the lender. This disclosure includes all of the loan information, such as the monthly payments, final costs, etc. It also includes the costs and fees due at closing. Your client needs to review all of this carefully and make sure they fully understand the terms of the loans and what's required at closing. If they have any questions, they need to reach out to the lender for clarification, so everything closes smoothly and on time.